I told Cynthia I, I went through so many passages of Scripture. And I guess when you have some time off, and I spent a lot of time in my office and just seeking the Lord, reading His Word, and just relaxing really, and so many things. But there's a passage of Scripture, I know that you know it's in the Word of God, if you've read it, but I don't know how often you go back to it. But it is one that I allude to often. And it is one that I refer to as the grand promise. The grand promise. And that's what I'll simply preach on. And uh, so if you stand with me today, I'm going to be reading out of the book of Romans. And I'm going to the very last chapter. In chapter 16. And I'm going to be looking at verse 20. Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. Everybody have it? Amen. And so I want you to see it. I want you to grab hold of it. And especially as we are facing a brand new year. Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. Here's what Paul says as he's coming to the conclusion of this, not only this grand promise, but it's found in this grand book of Romans that reaches the mountain peaks of, uh, of spirituality and truth and doctrine uh, like no other book in the Bible. But here's what he says. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. I could stop there, but he goes on and he starts into his conclusion to this letter and some salutations. He said, the grace of our Lord Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. The grand promise. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. Shortly. Shortly. Hallelujah. Amen. Right away. Yes. God's going to do it. When you, when you first look at this particular little verse, and I'm kind of isolating it, and I'm not going to get into the context ever so much, but each word kind of screams out, and it alludes to the fact and lets us know that the individuals to whom Paul is writing to this time here, and most of the time that the title of the book and the letter is to whom he's writing to, so to the to the Romans. But it, it's it's as if each and every word alludes to the fact that these precious followers of the Lord that they are in the battle of their lives. We see that there is this spiritual conflict that is going on between them and the enemy of their souls of which is alluded here Satan, the devil of the enemy of each and every one of us. And so we, we know a little bit of what, what that particular group was going through and uh, certainly it was trials and, and tribulations. But you know what, church? You and I are in this spiritual battle even here in 2022. We were in it in 2021 and we're still in it here in 2022. Now the amazing thing is is that this verse alludes every word kind of speaks of this uh, spiritual battle that is raging. But yet each and every word also alludes 
is filled with promise. It is filled with comfort and calm and insurance. It's filled with encouragement to these people that, hey, no matter what you're going through, God is going to bring you out on the other side victorious more than a conqueror. Now it's kind of amazing, you know, when I read the Word of God, I try to take every word, I think you know that that uh, as I've said, that every word is in there for a reason. And not only is every word, but even the placement of, uh, of, of the scriptures and how that Paul or the other writers. Uh, and what you're going to find here is that where Paul said, and the God of peace is going to bruise Satan under your feet shortly, that you will notice that this is at the very end of the book. And if you really notice, you will see that this is the last point that Paul wants to make to them. In other words, this is the last thing that he wants them to forget. This is the thing that he wants them to carry on in their mind. Now let me tell you, as I said, the book of Romans, I mean, it is a glorious book, but it's, it's very profound and sometimes maybe a little difficult to understand but yet Paul is telling us what Jesus has done and how he has accomplished it on the cross for us and, and all of that is so needful and so necessary but the very last little nugget of truth that he leaves with them is this verse that I I've read to you. So how important is that? It's very important. Now, yeah, it's not the very last verse of the letter. There's a few more, but it's basically salutations. He's greeting them from other individuals and then he brings the conclusion like he did and I read there, may the grace of God be with you and, and so he's bringing it to a conclusion uh, and, and so at the very end here of chapter 16, he's giving these last little tidbit nuggets. He doesn't get into them in depth, but he just uh, makes the point and then he goes on. But this is the very last one. And so when I see the importance of this wonderful promise of Almighty God. I see the importance not only to whom Paul was writing to and the circumstances at which he was writing, but the placement of this verse is the very last admonition, the very last promise that he wanted them to secure in their minds. And so there's three things that as we slice and dice and divide this passage of Scripture, there are three principles, three truths that I want you to see in this little promise. The first one is, I simply call it the calm. The calm. Yes. Well, we don't seem to have a whole lot of calm in the day in which we live in. People running to and fro and, and don't know where they're going, don't know where they've come from, don't know what they're doing, and just confusion and chaos and, and uh, angst and anxiety and fear. Uh, but here I call it the calm because notice how Paul starts out and how he addresses is this God. He said, and the God of peace. 
the God of peace. Now, I know in one sense that is the perfect word for this situation, but I know in another sense that it kind of seems ironic in the choice of words. Obviously, we want peace. Obviously, that's what we, we're seeking, but when it comes to the devil, we need to understand he'll never give a ceasefire. He'll never give up. He'll never quit until the Lord puts him in his rightful place, locks the door with the key, and binds him there for eternity. And so we know that peace is not going to be achievable in the sense as there's not going to be any more war. There's not going to be any more troubles, rumors of war. And even for the child of God that uh, there's never going to come a time when there is that peace where there is lack of this spiritual battle going on with the enemy. And so in my mind that if I'm thinking that I'm in the battle of my life and I need the help of the Lord, uh, would it not have been better if Paul would have said, and the God of power. And the God of protection. The God of provision. The God of preeminence. The God of position. The God of this, we want to see a demonstration of, of what Paul can do, and certainly we'll see it. Uh, but, but yet Paul says, and the God of peace is the one that's going to accomplish this. And then it comes to our mind as to what Paul is thinking of in the directive and the direction that he's going with this. He's saying that, hey church, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, you can have the peace of God. Praise God. You can have that spiritual, godly calm in your life. In another place, Paul calls it and refers to it as the peace that passes all understanding. In other words, there's no reason for you to have a peace in the pit of your soul. There's no reason for it. In fact, when you look at the external circumstances and acts and events that's going on, it would prove very distressful and the very opposite. And that's why it's the peace that passes all understanding. In the midst of the storm, God's people can have His peace. We can live with a... Um, regardless of what's going on around us. I may have used this. It's an old, old illustration, but I think that it perfectly describes the kind of peace that the child of God can have. There were artists that were commissioned to paint a painting of peace, tranquility. In their mind, how could they express that on the canvas? And one did a winter scene, which was very beautiful. There was snow on the ground, snow in the trees. It was in the evening, and there was a house with a picket fence, and <clears throat> there was the windows that was open, and the light was shining out of the window reflecting upon the snow on the outside and you could see the fireplace and, and the light and the warmth in the family and, and to him that was peace 
tranquility. I can get that. I understand that. There was another that to them was this meadow and this pond and, and the forest and the trees and it's beautiful, the green grass, the flowers, the foliage of the trees and there's ducks on the pond, deer standing out by the woods uh, in the very edge of the meadow and on and on and on. And I can see where that would be peace as well. But there was one that stood out because it was none of the paintings that in your mind you would imagine a piece. Rather, it was on a craggy cliff by the seashore. The storms, and it was raining torrential downpour, the black clouds in the sky. The wind you can see is blowing the rain almost sideways, and uh, the billows of the waves uh, hitting up on the rocks. And, and, and you look at that and you think, uh, that doesn't even bring a remote kind of a thought of peace. But if you, if you look closely, you would find a couple of turtle doves in, in the cliff as we sang about in the cliff of that rock and there they were sheltered and there from the storm the rain and all of the rest could not touch them and as I began to think about that I, I thought that truly for the child of God is what peace is peace for us is not the elimination or the cessation cessation of battles and war and conflict but it means in the middle of all of that we can still have the calm and the peace of almighty God that he holds us in the hollow of his hand and he's going to protect us and he's going to watch over us so in this grand promise lay hold of the peace of God Church, we're going to need it in 2022. There's going to be things that's, even when you think nothing could shock you anymore coming forth, but we're going to be shocked yet again. And we're going to say, how can this be? And if you're not careful, it'll start to breed fear and anxiety and trouble in your heart. But praise God, we know who we are. We know our heavenly Father, we know the peace that he has and the place that he has prepared for us. Yes, amen. Praise God. So I see first of all this calm, the God of peace <laughs> in the midst of the storm. What a God. But not only do I see the calm, but I see a crushing you say, Pastor, I don't see any crushing here. Well, in the King James, it's one of those where I often say I like the King James, the translation. Uh, but there are some words, certainly, that back when it was translated a few hundred years ago, that uh, the word has changed its meaning. And so the word bruise here, that he's going to bruise, he said, in this promise, that he's going to bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Now in our mind, when we think about a bruise, we think that maybe you hit yourself or you run up against something or somebody punches you or whatever the case may be. But it's not life-threatening and yeah, you get a bruise wherever you were hit or uh, whatever happened, uh, but it's not life-threatening and you go on. But that certainly is not the idea of the what the original word means. It does not mean just to put a bruise upon, but literally the word means to crush. Now that's a whole different scenario. 
God's going to give the devil a few, a few bruises on your behalf? No, he's literally going to crush him. Now, we're not shouting yet, but we need to be. <laughs> I think what Paul is letting us know here is that in this spiritual battle that we're engaged in and will be engaged in, he's simply saying that you and I, through the power of the substitutionary work of Jesus on the cross and out of the grave victorious, that you and I are not able just to get in a, a few good licks here and there and maybe bruise the enemy. But by the power of God, we're able to put him under our feet and literally crush him. Praise God. Have you ever noticed how some people seemingly, as a child of God, even in the storm, they go on and uh, they have that peace and, and they have that victory and others do not? Uh, so it's, it's all in that, that faith of believing, Lord, you're going to do it. Now notice here that this is not what I'm going to do. This is not what Rich Goldison is going to achieve. But this is what God and only God can accomplish in my life. That only God is the one that can put Satan under my feet and completely crush him in the name of Jesus. Now, uh, does that mean that we're going to crush him once and for all? No. The battle's going to go on until the Lord... But he's saying that whatever you face, God is not just able to get you barely through it, but God is able and he's in control and has the power that he's able to completely crush the devil and all of his power and all of his ideas and all of his uh, regiments that he wants to put together uh, to destroy us and wipe us off of the face of the spiritual map, the Lord is saying instead of the enemy doing that to you, you can do that to the enemy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You see, this all goes back to, as I said, this is not what we're going to do, but it all goes back to the Lord. <laughs> Jesus and his what he accomplished for us if, if, if you read the scripture and, and this word bruise here comes up uh, there's a scripture that automatically just bam takes you right back to that and the one I'm referring to is back in Genesis chapter 3 and it's in verse 14 there but here the the writer in Genesis He's talking about that after Adam and Eve had sinned, that God is divvying out, if you will, the consequences of that sin. Uh, Eve, because of what you've done, this is what you brought upon woman. Adam, because of what you've done, this is what you've brought upon man. And I'm talking gender here, not mankind, but male and female. And then he goes to the devil as well and said, here's part of the curse for you that you're going to crawl upon your belly for the rest of your life. So it implies to us, I don't know what the devil looked like and what kind of image he was and took on, but he wasn't upright standing, or, or he probably was upright standing, and he probably was something beautiful, but now he's a snake. And he's going to, from now on, eat the dust of the ground. Now, if you're on your belly and you're eating the dust of the ground, you're about as low as you can get. But the writer goes on and says, I'm going to put enmity, I'm going to put this separation between the seed of woman and the seed of you, the serpent. Now, obviously, the devil doesn't have any 
children, but talking about those angels that fell with him and was pitched out of heaven. But he talks about the seed of woman. And of course referring to that down the line that Jesus is going to come and which we just celebrated as the seed of woman. And he said that the seed of woman that, that Satan, you're going to bruise his heel. But he's going to bruise your stinking head. Yes, right. Right. Yes. Praise God. He is going to step on you and turn, I can imagine, with his heel. <laughs> And he's literally going to crush you. But in the process of doing that, his heel will be affected, crushed, or, or hurt. And we know that Jesus was hurt in the process. He had to die. He died a horrible death on your and my behalf. But while his heel was being hurt, he did it so that he could literally crush the head of the serpent. It's interesting to me that, you know, I, I didn't really know this uh, for a long time, but do you realize that you can cut off the head of a rattlesnake? And they can still lunge at you after the head is separated from the rest of the body. And they can kill you. I had no idea about that. I thought you cut off the head, that's it. So the Lord didn't say, I'm going to cut your head off. <laughs> he said, I'm going to take my heel and I'm going to grind you into the dirt. Right. right. I'm going to crush you. In church, when we, we see all of this, I, I, I do want to hurry here, but, but there's so many other things that comes into mind. We know that this thing of, of putting your heel upon or putting your foot upon or a stepping on or treading on. The Bible is filled with all of the, all of this figure uh, of, of this figure of speech, and it's a picture word. We've talked about it before, but it goes back to the military of that day. That when the leading victorious general that when he would win over the other general and take him alive, he would strip him of his helmet and his shield and his sword and, and his breastplate and everything else. And he would lay him flat upon the ground. He's absolutely helpless. And he would take his sword and he would place it over the heart of the defeated general. And then one last act, he would take his foot and put it upon his neck or upon his chest. What does that mean? It's symbolic of complete victory over. Complete authority over. Complete power over. I would dare say that a lot of us as Christians, we don't view the devil that way. For the child of God. Praise God. That's how we need to view yes. it. That's the ultimate and the perfect victory that God 
has given to us. You know, somebody said, and it's so true, you know, we know the devil is a liar. But he said there's two basic lies that the devil does to navigate through this world. First of all, to some people, he makes himself more powerful than what he is. And that's how I believe a lot of Christians view the devil. He's, he's so powerful. But he's nothing. He's a wimp yes. for you and me as a child of God. He's already been crushed. Yes. Hallelujah. But then the other lie is he said that he'll make himself to be more powerful and generate fear. But then on the other side, he'll make himself as if he doesn't exist. And that's where the world looks at this good and evil. There is not this epic battle. There's no God. There's no uh, physical entity of evil. And so we see how that it all plays within to the, to the hand of the enemy. Right. But church, we need to see him who he is and we need to see ourselves as we are. Do you know the Bible says, and I want to go back to Christ, but he said he'll put, he'll bruise him under our feet. Yes. But it starts out with Jesus' feet. Right. That he's put all enemies under his feet. Jesus. And the Bible says that we are the body of Christ. And we are the individual members of the body of Christ. So it makes me to know that even if you are the soul of the foot of the body of Christ... You're still walking on the devil. Yes. No matter where you may feel like I've got not a whole lot to offer in the body of Christ. I'm not the head. I'm not the eye. I'm not the ear. I'm not the hand. Uh, I'm not the arm. I'm not the leg. I'm not these things that are we would consider important. I'm not the heart. I'm not the lung. Go on and go on and go on. You know, what, what part of the body is that you don't think much about is, is the sole of your feet? But even if you're the soul of the foot in the body of Christ, said he has put all enemies under his feet. That means that as a part of the body of Christ, they're all under your feet as well. So don't let the devil lie. This is this grand promise. The calm, the God of peace is going to completely crush Satan under your feet. Now the last thing that I want us to see, and honey, if you'll get ready to come, is not only this calm, the God of peace, not only this crushing that he's going to bruise Satan or crush him under your feet, but it's the last word in that sentence, shortly. I call it the confidence. And the reason I call it the confidence is this. We're always going to be in a battle. We're going to be facing something generally all the time. There are going to be times in our life when things are, are going a little smoother than other times. We all know that. It's life. We may be affected physically. We may be affected financially. We may be affected with, uh, without a vehicle or without a job or uh, something going on domestically in the home. Uh, th th there's a lot of things that, that could go on. And we know that as a child of God, we're victorious over all of that. But, but you've heard me say it and others down through the centuries that as a child of God, God doesn't always take us out of the problem, but He takes us through the problem. And sometimes when we go through the problem, sometimes it may last a few moments. Other times it may last a day. Other times it may last a week, a month, a year, or years. The 
But here's what Paul's wanting them and us to get a hold of. It doesn't matter what you went through in 2021. It doesn't matter what we will face in 2022. It doesn't matter how long that trial and that battle may last. You've got to have the confidence that very shortly God's going to bring this thing to an end. Yes, praise God. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what that little word shortly or soon can do to the morale of a person. You know, I, 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 I like to read the stories of, of men of God, especially in military, and on the battlefield, and how they've trusted God, and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, many of them were prisoners of war, and World War II, and, and the Vietnam War, and all, all wars, and how they were tortured. And not knowing when this was ever going to end and hope to die to bring an end to it. But when they got just a glimmer of hope that Praise the God. war was just about mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. Soon the allies were coming in. Now we don't know when, but we know that just by... It's going to happen shortly. It's going to happen soon. The building of faith and hope and strength renewed in your life again. And we do get beaten down. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Come on, church. We do. Mm -hmm. We do get tired. We do get weary. We do question the point, can I even go on? But the point of the matter is, God is either going to do it in your life shortly down here on this earth, or He's going to bring it all to a conclusion shortly. Praise God, yes. When we're all going to be in the presence Hallelujah. of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Shortly. Man, what a message you could preach on shortly. <laughs> shortly. <laughs> yeah. Russ, you had that cancer that you struggled with for a long time. But you're not struggling with it anymore. Shortly. Shortly. And so whatever that trial is, you've got to have the faith and the confidence that God is going to bring you out. God will take you through, but He will bring you out on the other side. Yes, he will. That, that's why the Bible yes, always will. talks about that you go through trouble for a little while, but then God is going to bring you out shortly. Weeping may endure for the night. Yes. But joy Hallelujah. comes in the morning. Yes, it does. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise so God. Hold on, child of God. This wonderful passage of Scripture. The last thing that Paul wanted to say basically to the Romans is the first thing I wanted to say to you in 2022. The God of peace is going to bruise and crush Satan under your feet. Praise God. Shortly. Yes. Father, I love you. I thank you for the word of God. Never promised the cross would not get heavy. You would not be hard. Hey Lord, to we do get weary. We get tired. He never offered our faith is tried. Victories without fighting. 
but he we wonder if we can go on or what can we do if, if anything can be done there's times we feel hopeless when you're standing in the valley of the father in the midst of it all the adversary say give me the calm that i can have the peace of god in the midst of it all me the realization, realization that the devil's already defeated. It's not up to me to defeat him. He's already crushed. He's already nothing. And he only becomes something as I allow him to do so by my doubt and my fear in my life. And Lord, that confidence that regardless of what my brother or sister has been in and they're carrying it over from 2021 it's, it's been it's been going on for a long while but god give us a confidence that shortly 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 lord this thing's coming to an end whether in my life here you're going to work a miracle or Lord, whether you're coming back and you're making it all right. One way or the other, Lord, shortly, shortly, you're going to do it, Jesus. So God, give us hope. Give us faith. Give us comfort. Give us confidence. Give us encouragement here today. Lord, I'll give you the praise and I'll give you the glory for asking in the name of Jesus.